Hey everyone, and welcome to the Uncorked Corner podcast, where we cover the full spread of food and beverage industry topics. My name is Bianca, PR and marketing professional by day and food and wine connoisseur by night. And my name is Nick, an accountant with a passion for barbecue, beer, and whiskey. Today we welcome Janie brooks Hilp, Managing Director of Brooks Wine. In this episode, Janie talks to us about the origins of Brooks Wine and her role as Managing Director. We also talk through the winery, wine clubs, and their broad selection of wines, including the delicious Runaway Red Pinot Noir and Aura Riesling. If you enjoy this podcast, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to us. With that said, let's welcome Janie to the show. Welcome everyone. Uh, today we have Janie from Swine on the show. We are so excited to invite her in and would love to start by having her tell us a bit about herself. So my name is Janie brooks Wake, and I've um, been in the wine industry 16 years, born and raised in Portland, Oregon, left Oregon in 1989 to go to college in Arizona, where I lived for 18 years with my husband, got married while I was there. Then we moved to California um, for his work in 1999 and decided to be a stay-at-home mom. So I was a stay-at-home mom for about five years um, until the point that my brother, Jimmy, um, passed away unexpectedly, and that was in 2004. He owned a winery in the Willamette Valley, and when I got to his house the night that he passed away, um, I had a group there that wanted to continue the winery for at least another year, but also asked me to get involved in the business. So that is why I've been in the wine industry for 16 years now. And I see, so you're the managing director right now for the winery. So what does that entail? So I do everything but pretty much make the wine. So I oversee all the finances, all the operations, um, the marketing, sales, and hospitality. Um, I support the winemaking team with the equipment they need, the the grapes that we purchase, um, but I don't do anything with making the wine. Our winemaker, Chris Williams, was my brother's dear friend and also my brother's assistant winemaker. So he's actually been with Brooks for over 20 years. Nice. And do you have any background in the business management before jumping into it or did you kind of just learn on the fly? No, I do. I, so my degree from Arizona State was in accounting. And I did that for a little bit, but after about four years, I had an opportunity to go work for a startup company where I was the second employee. And it was a healthcare benefits company for Medicare um, eligibles and um, program called Silver Sneakers that still exists today. But going in there as employee number two and leaving um, when we had over 200 employees and $50 million in revenue, I built pretty much all the infrastructure for that business. So there was a lot of transferable things to what I was able to bring to Brooks, just not industry specific. That helps a lot. And the finance mind definitely helps translate into a lot of different aspects of the business. I'm an well, accountant myself, so. <laughs> I well, could... my husband wonders where his accountant went because he married me as an accountant at one of the big eight firms. And I really did that to get a good job out of college. And I do like accounting, but in the wine industry, it's like, if you don't have the sales, there's nothing to count. So you just, I'm hustling on the sales side all the time. And you guys have such a large selection of wines. Uh, so which ones were your first offered? Or do you know like the history, like what were your first introductions? Yeah, so Pinot Noir and Riesling. So our Janus Pinot Noir and our Willamette Valley Riesling were the first two wines that my brother made in 1998. So we consider those our flagships. Um, 1999, he added two entry-level Pinot Noirs, the Runaway Red and the Willamette Valley Pinot. So those are at lower price points um, with a little bit higher margin or volume. And then he also created the Amicus White Blend, which is modeled after an Alsace Edelsvicker type of wine. So it has um, five of the noble varietals in it. So that we started in 99. Um, added two additional wines, our Reserve Riesling, the Ara, and the Rostovan Pinot Noir in 2003. 
and pretty much have added most of the rest of them since 2014. With so many to pick from, is there a favorite that you often reach for? My favorite, my favorite white is always the Ara <laughs> Riesling, and my favorite Pinot Noir is always the Janus, which is our flagship. But you know, we do, we make over 60 different wines, and we do that to really reflect and to appreciate the grower that made the decisions to plant what they planted, where they planted it. And so we really like to show expressions in small quantities. None of those wines are more than a couple hundred cases um, across the line. We have <clears throat> the brands that my brother developed and a few more. Those are the ones that are in national distribution that we make more quantity of. So obviously every year seasonality is going to bring out different flavors in the grapes when you're making the wines. Uh, so is that why you have such a big selection because you don't really want to sort of repeat on the wines instead of having inconsistency with one brand, you just kind of make a new wine whenever you have new grapes? You know, we're always super consistent with our core wines. So the ones that are in the national market in terms of using all of our different components to get back to a similar style. So that a buyer in Boston is when they buy the Runaway Red, the Runaway Red's pretty much in that same um, range in terms of style without having to manipulate the wine. So all of our wines are biodynamic. Um, we don't do any manipulation. So then what happens is once we've built kind of those bigger pieces, we have the flexibility within the single vineyards to make what we want. So sure, in one year we might need more of like our estate fruit to be part of the Runaway Red or and that leaves less for the estate bottling. So we always start kind of with that core in mind. And you guys have a big focus on sustainability in, in your carbon footprint, and I've seen that on your social pages. What are you doing as a company to kind of incorporate that into your everyday business practices? Well, we've been practicing biodynamics in our farming since 2002. And so we are certified both in the vineyard and in the winery for biodynamics. In 2019, we added two additional things. We became a certified B Corporation, um, which is B Corporation is a rigorous certification, but it basically allows you to say that you care as much about your stakeholders, whether that's your team, whether that's your environment, whether that's your suppliers, you care about every, your community, all of those entities as part of your business, as much as you do your shareholders. Um, so it's really about doing business for good and not just for profit. There's only 3,300 companies that are certified in the world. There's 19 wineries and nine of those are in the Willamette Valley. And we're very proud of that. Um, the other thing we did in 2019 is we joined um, as members of 1% for the Planet. And 1% for the Planet was founded by Yvonne Chenard, who founded Patagonia. And his belief is that we all should be paying rent to the earth, that it doesn't matter who you are or what your business is, we are all taking from our planet and we need to be giving back. And if we all give back a little, it would make a big difference. It is an amazing program. Um, we're so proud of that. And we, we get to direct our funds to one of their certified um, environmental-based nonprofits, and so we selected a company called Kiss the Ground, and they are an education and media company about farming and the impact of farming on not only our personal health, but on the climate as well. Nice, and uh, from their work, just to kind of elaborate a little bit on that, are there any specific things that we could look to to see more about what they do? For Kiss the Ground, yep. sure. They have a great website. Um, they have a lot of classes that they offer. There is a short film on biodynamics, just a five minute film that we help sponsor about biodynamic farming. And on, I think it's either September 21st or 22nd, they have a feature length documentary coming out on farming um, that Woody Harrelson is actually the narrator for. And um, it's coming out on Netflix. Nice, that'll definitely be an interesting one to check out. Yeah, I've, I've heard it's a little controversial because it is against, you know, big business chemically using farms, so. And as someone who didn't necessarily start intending to be in the wine business, how would you recommend people learn about wine um, if they have no idea where they're starting? 
Taste, taste a lot. I mean, I think that's the most important thing because people, you either like wine or you don't, or like a wine or you don't. And so you really have to figure out where you're, what you like and what you don't like. And there are no wrong and right answers. Um, there are plenty of different varietals. There's plenty of different regions. There's plenty of different winemaking styles that there's definitely wine for everybody. Um, but tastings, tasting is the most important. And for people who want to try your wines, where are you available outside of your home state? So we sell our wines to 44 different states around the country. Um, mostly independent retail, so not a lot of the big box retail like the Bevmo's or Total Wines and more. We're typically in the small indie shops. Um, and then restaurants. Restaurants was a huge part of our business at the moment. Um, obviously not as much as it used to be. We also are licensed to ship to 44 states as well. Thanks. And um, on that, I also noticed you have a few different wine clubs for people to partake in. So can anyone join those and have their wines shipped straight to them? They can. And for the people who don't live near Oregon, because often you get great benefits in a wine club when you get to go there, which we of course have, but I realize that not everybody can come to Brooks on a regular basis. Even if you're in Portland, you know, we're an hour away. So our 12 bottle wine club is awesome. It ships twice a year and it's really intended for people who can't get to the winery. It's fully customizable. So you could pick the same 12 bottles for your shipment or you could pick 12 different bottles. It's a 25% discount off of retail and your shipping's included. And for every case that you buy during the year, it's the same, those same benefits. So it's by far, if you can't get to the winery and enjoy the view and enjoy the food, it is by far the best wine club to join. That's awesome. And you, I also saw that you have a four bottle and a six bottle as well. What are some of the benefits with those two if you just want, I guess, less bottles? So the, the four bottle tends to have our classic wines, which are the ones that we tend to sell in distribution. Um, not as many of the single vineyard offerings and it ships three times a year and you get a 15 percent discount on that wine and plus you on site you do get to enjoy those benefits and then the six bottle includes not only our classic wines but also single vineyards and you can pick as a six bottle member if you want reds whites or both um it's a fixed shipping um of 35 dollars but actually during covid we've been shipping six bottles complimentary and probably will do that forever now going forward um, and, it, and it has a bigger discount, so. And speaking of not being able to visit, so for those who aren't able to visit, you also have your virtual wine tasting. Um, mm -hmm. Can you tell us more about what that program looks like and is that something that everybody, you know, from all over the US can participate in? Yeah, you know, it is, and I'm one of those people that when COVID happened, I just watched, right, what everybody else was doing in the wine industry. and. Um, you see a lot of people offering, here's our three pack, join us Friday night at five o'clock or whatever, two weeks from now. You saw a lot of wineries talking about a wine live on Instagram or live on Facebook, talking to who knows who, I'm not really sure, whoever was watching at the moment. And I just really, it's like to me, the human side and the connection to the customer is the first thing you have to build before you can sell wine. And so we started... I got fancy, I named it Sips and Stories. We've now called it virtual tastings because nobody understands what Sips and Stories is. Um, but they're basically customly built. So somebody emails me, they tell me how many people, what date, what general topics they're interested in because we could do the general Willamette Valley, we could do one just about Riesling, we could do one just about biodynamic farming, whatever is of interest. Um, and we build it from there. So I've done everything. I do probably three to four a week. And they range from banks who are hosting clients to companies who are hosting their team because their team can't get together for regular meetings, birthday parties, wine club members, groups that used to travel to wine regions together every year but can't travel this year. Um, and then we just really customize it based on what's your budget and what do you want to accomplish. I, I'm all game because it gives me the opportunity to meet people. And that's one of the, you know, the biggest challenges with COVID is I normally am on the road all the time doing wine dinners and tastings and meeting, you know, the end consumer and we don't get to do that right now. Um, so the virtual tastings have been great. 
And then for people that can visit on premise, I saw you guys have a lot of events and experiences that you can have in person. So, I mean, obviously right now things might be a little bit more limited than usual, but typically what can people expect to experience at the vineyards? So for the everyday experience, um, you get a choice of a couple of flights. Right now we are only doing one, we used to do three. Um, but there's six wines on the flight and we always have about 40 bottles available for purchase. We have a full-time chef, um, so we have a full menu every day. We also have um, beer on tap, we have cider on tap. We don't really care what you wanna drink, we just want you to come drink with us. Gorgeous views, we have big deck, big ground, so it's been really nice this summer. People have felt very safe and spread out. Um, one of the best views in the Willamette Valley, you can see four mountains on a, on a clear day, um, looking straight out at Mount Hood. And it's all table side service. So I really built a place that I wanted to hang out in. Um, I don't like the high pressure sale. I don't like typical tasting rooms. So we built more like a lounge. Um, so it's a lot of fun. Now I'm seeing so much about Chef Norma on your pages and the incredible food that she is putting out. Uh, how long has she been with you guys? And is that, you know, your menu is just so cool and the pairings and all of this like the food just looks fantastic um can you tell us more about how you kind of steer your menu is it seasonal and you know how long has she been with you guys um she's been with us for two years and we didn't start we built that building in 2014 without the intention of having a chef but i did build a commercial kitchen because knowing the one or two times a year that we would have a big event all my chef friends said we'll make it a commercial kitchen don't give me a fancy residential kitchen i need you know pans and trays and things to fit. And we used to just do cheese and charcuterie and then it evolved into hiring a chef. And Norma's just been super with her program. We do change the menu monthly. We also change the wines on the flight monthly. As much as possible of the food that goes into her dishes comes from the garden. So it is very seasonal. Her and her gardener, you know, are, are working together on a daily basis, talking about what he's planting and what the time frame is so that they can get in front of the different crops for the different seasons. Um, and fresh as local as much as possible. Um, but super like I go up there for a week, a month, and I make sure I get to try every single thing on the menu, and sometimes twice. I order dinner to go. <laughs> I'm like, can you pack up? I'm jealous. <laughs> yeah, delicious food, and you know, Norma does a ton of events for us too, and um, we do these events called Pizza Friday, where once a month during the summer, we, we get 150 pizzas out the door. People love it. Um, she's tremendous, and she does cooking classes, so we've done pizza classes, oyster shucking classes, her truffle class is coming up this fall. So we, we try to have as many events and as experiences to, to grab a wide range of interests and audience so that there's something for everybody. And with the food menu, is there any thought to the pairings when she's kind of coming up with her meals or is that more of an after the fact, this is what this meal is, and then you find a wine that pairs best with that no, it's a conversation going into the month. So like this month, we call it our legacy month because it's the anniversary month of when my brother passed away. So I knew I wanted to feature wines on the flight that were, um, that he made, that he started, that were the beginnings of the brand. So she kind of knew what the wines were going to be. She had this idea of wanting to do this flatbread taco. And so she ended up, you know, figuring out which wine based on what ingredients she wanted to have in the taco that we put together on the flight. That is very cool. And for the visitors who come and for those people who are ordering, do you find that there are, you know, top sellers all the time or is it very much kind of mixed? You know, it's really mixed. So we, we've built our website. Luckily we just launched a new website in February that was built for e-commerce. And so the shop pages that you see are actually dynamic. So the one that says top sellers, that actually takes the top selling wines and feeds it into that collection. And um, we have a Riesling and a Pinot Noir section, of course, those can be a little overwhelming, um, which is why we have like our hidden gems. So everything that we make that's not Riesling or Pinot Noir is in the hidden gems, or we have a biodynamic category. So we hope that those collection pages really lead people to what they're interested in. And 
on that, while you have the top sellers, are there any limited or special edition wines that you guys have out right now that you're excited for people to try? Well, the Cayenne Riesling and Pinot Noir are super um, exciting for everyone and they're limited. And that was a label that my nephew, my, my brother had an eight-year-old son when he passed away, Pascal, who owns the winery outright and is 24 years old now. And when he turned 21, I said, why don't you write your own label? So he didn't make the wines, but our winemaker loved it because I got to tell him he had to make two wines that he wasn't already making. So he got to get creative. But Cayenne means notebook in French. And it is because that is how my nephew has gotten to know his dad is through his dad's journals. And my nephew also writes a lot. And then those bottles come wrapped in tissue paper with excerpts from my, my brother's journals. So special bottling. We do have, um, we've only made one vintage of sparkling Riesling and it's been sold out for about eight months. We are releasing the next vintage November 1st. So we only make 400 cases of it. And one of the other collections that I found really interesting is the Psalm collection, which you had. I'm not sure if you still have all those bottles, but um, those vintages and, and the labels are so different than a lot of your other ones. Um, can you tell us about some of those people that you worked with and partnered on with those and the net proceeds were donated. So I'd love to hear more about maybe the people that you're supporting. Yeah, so the intention for that program originally was education. It was to bring Psalms out from around the country because we we buy from, we have our own estate vineyard, but we buy from 28 other vineyards and we keep everything in really small lots. And so I was thinking when they literally at a stoplight, I'm like, I could bring out Psalms and they could taste 10 examples of a 115 clone and really understand a what 115 clone contributes to Pinot Noir, but also the differences in vine age, aspect, elevation, um, soil type. So it started as a program for that. So we brought out a bunch of Psalms the first year and the agreement was you come do a day of education. The second day you get to blend your own Pinot Noir from eight different components. And then you commit to buying 56 cases of that at least and taking it back to your store or your restaurant. So we did this for a number of years. Um, right now, most of them are restaurants and most of those restaurants are closed. So they lost their opportunity to sell that product. And so we agreed, well, why don't we sell it on our website, but we'll take the margin difference that what I would have gotten from distribution, that's what I'll still get, but we'll take the difference between that and the retail price and support charities of your choice. Um, so we have quite a few charities. We have a couple more that will be coming online before the end of the year. Um, we make a couple wines with Laura Maniak from Cork Buzz in New York City. Um, Matthew Kaner from a couple restaurants in LA was with us for a long time. Brooke Sable was at Nader in New Jersey. She's now at Gary's um, in New Jersey. Cappy Pete, she's an interesting one because she started at McCready's in South Carolina where we made her a label. And then she moved to work with Ashley Christensen in North Carolina. And so now we make a different label for her, but it's the same song behind the wine. Um, we do make a wine for a country singer. We make a wine for Clay Walker. And the wine is called Concho. So it, those are really fun projects. Nice. And uh, so let's get into some of the wine tasting over here. So. I have the 2018 Ara that we've already discussed here. It's one of your favorites, you said. Uh, it's delicious, I've been sipping on it. Do you wanna take us through some of the tasting notes that people can expect out of this? I am no expert on wine, so I'm not a good one to comment on that. So I will leave that to you. Yeah, for sure. So the Ara first off um, is super special because it's an intentional blend of two of the oldest vine Riesling sites in the Willamette Valley, but they're each on their own soil type. So we've done a lot of work with Riesling trying to understand if you're on volcanic soil, what kind of fruit profile do you get from your Riesling? And we know that that tends to be very lemon, lime, citrus oriented, um, very met, a lot of salinity and minerality. So that wine, that portion of the wine really brings through a lot of um, lemon components and oyster shell type of components. 
The other half of it comes from an old vine vineyard that's on marine sedimentary soil, which we know produces a lot of stone fruit characteristics. So that's where you're really getting kind of that riper peach flavor that melds into the wine. And so it's really that combination of those two vineyard sites and those different profiles that we put into the ARA on purpose so that you can get such a wide range of different flavors from a singular wine. It's completely dry which is also important. So many people think that Riesling is always sweet. Um, there are sweet Rieslings in the world and we make plenty of sweet Rieslings, but they have really good acid. So our wines are always very food driven. 2018, the one that you have is, um, was a warm vintage. So it's definitely, you get a bigger mouth feel from that wine. It's also currently our highest rated wine that we have. It got 94 points from Wine and Spirits Magazine this year which was the highest for any domestic Riesling that they rated. That's awesome. Congratulations. That's Thanks. an honor. <laughs> yeah, um, we were one of their top 100 wineries of 2019 last year, which 100 in the world. So pretty exciting. That's very cool. It's definitely, that's definitely a big deal. So that's nothing to be uh, humble about, of course. <laughs> um, the other one, that I, the one that I opened, so Nick and I, he opened the white, so I figured I'd go with the red. Um, I opened the 2018 Runaway Red Pinot Noir, and this, as I had mentioned before, is actually one of my favorite Pinots that I purchase for myself often. Uh, one of our local wine shops carries it. So I, you know, I'm a big fan of you guys and of this wine in particular. Um, I think what I find the most interesting about this, and just after reading about it, is that you source the grapes from six different vineyards. And I think that's pretty cool, because a lot of the time, you know, maybe it comes from one or two, but six is quite the mix. Um, what is it that sourcing from all six of those does to change the flavor of the wine? So we bottle two Pinot Noirs the summer after harvest. One of them is the Runaway Red that you have, and the other one is our Willamette Valley Pinot Noir. And we will go through the process before we do any of the blends. So everything's still all separate, all separate barrels. And we know what wines typically from what vineyards that we are going to hold over for single vineyard bottlings. And we take everything else um, based on the quantities we want to produce and taste barrel by barrel. And if it is spicy, earthy, or bright red fruit toned, we mark it for the runaway red. And if it is, you know, darker fruit and more fruit forward, we mark that for the Willamette Valley Pinot Noir. And that's kind of our starting point. And then we go through and we blend all those barrels that are marked. So some years they can be 12 vineyards. Um, that year in 2018 was only six. So it really depends on the fruit profile, but the profile of the wine is always super consistent, if that makes sense. So definitely uh, yeah. more red fruit driven, which is not what people think of of Oregon Pinot Noir. They think Oregon Pinot Noir is gonna be more dark fruit and more fruit forward which is what, exactly what our Willamette Valley is. Nice. Yeah, and it's great that you have kind of wines that meet every end of that spectrum because people, you know, someone likes this and someone likes that and everyone's so different. Um, and, you know, sometimes places only have one option, whereas I think it's great that you really have that. So there's something for everybody, yeah. as long as they like wine. <laughs> and to dive back into the whites, we also have two other whites here, the 2019 Pinot Blanc and the 2019 Pinot Gris. Can you take us through those two varietals? What makes them different from each other and what we can expect out of them? Sure, so is it the Longstone Ridge Pinot Gris or the Estate Pinot Gris? Bianca, are you sure? Oh, I, sorry, I don't have it in front of me. Um, I can, we'll talk about the Pinot Blanc and I'll let you know in two seconds. Okay. <laughs> Pinot Blanc, so um, both Pinot Gris and Pinot Blanc are, are related to Pinot Noir. Um, they're the white versions, mutated versions of that grape. And Pinot Blanc tends to be super crisp and have really good acid, whereas Pinot Gris tends to be a little bit lighter on the acid side and a little bit more rounder in terms of the palate and the fruit profile. Um, our, both of those wines are old vine. So the Pinot Blanc was planned back in 1984. Um, just really dry, bright, crisp, easy to drink, perfect warm weather wine, really good with food. Um, and not that Pinot Gris isn't, it's all those same things too, but it, it's not going to come off as dry. It's going to be a little bit more fruitier on the palate, even though it's not sweet and a little bit weightier. Nice. And to get 
Uh, here she is now. We're back. Yeah. <laughs> it is the Logston Ridge. <clears throat> so the other thing that's interesting about the Logston Ridge, and that's the 2019, is last year we were lucky enough to end up getting two big oak casks from a winery in California, and we had always wanted oak casks. So that's very traditional in Germany to put Riesling in an oak cask. So we did put some of our Riesling in one of the casks, but then Chris really wanted to put the Logston Ridge Pinot Gris in the second cask. And when you put something in wood, you get more oxygen in it, and it really changes the profile of the wine and gives it a different texture. And he really was looking for more texture from the fruit from that vineyard. And so that actually, that wine has oak on it. Nice. And uh, when it comes to barreling, do you always go to wine barrels or recycled wine barrels, or do you ever start fresh barrels or maybe go to more of a whiskey barrel or something for different? Um, we always use French oak and typically medium toast. I'd say 70 per 60% of the barrels in our cellar are neutral, which means they've been used for five years or more. Um, but we always buy new every year. So anything that has one to four years of oak still imparts some sort of different flavor profile on the wine. And for, oh, sorry. For our wine listeners who aren't familiar with what toast describes, can you let them know what that means? Yeah, it's, the, it's basically the toasting of the oak in the barrel, and it imparts more wood flavor um, at a more significant rate than if it's not toasted. So you get barrels that are heavy toast, so they've been subject to more burning, and that definitely brings more oak to the wine versus something that might be light. So we prefer medium, kind of middle of the road. Um, we like, we really look at barrels as a vessel and not an influence. Pinot Noir, what's so important to us is that you actually are expressing the fruit itself. And if you use something that has too much toast in the barrel or too many new barrels, you really, lose the flavor of the Pinot Noir. Pinot Noir is very fragile, it's very delicate, and you really want something that's gonna, you know, enhance it versus take it over. Nice, and while we're on Pinot Noir, so we have two of those as well. We have the 2016 and the 2018. Can you tell us a little bit about how those two years are differing from each other? Yeah, they were both warm, actually. They weren't that different from each other. Um, is it the 2016 Janus? Yeah. Yeah. So that was in barrel for 18 months, where the 2018 Willamette Valley Pinot was in barrel for nine months. So if you were to taste that Runaway Red 2018 and Willamette Valley Pinot 2018 side by side, you would definitely see the differences in the fruit profiles I talked about with the Runaway Red being kind of bright red, spicy and earthy, and the Willamette Valley being darker and more fruit forward. But the 16 and 18 vintages weren't that different. Pretty much 14, 15, 16. 18 were all considered warm and probably the warmest vintages on record in Oregon. So a little bit riper in style. And I have a question. So what the design of your logo and for those who haven't seen it, check out their website and social because it's on everything. Um, what was the inspiration behind it? It's I've, I've never seen a wine with like a dragon on it. Uh, so I'm genuinely curious uh, how that was kind of pulled together. So it's called an Ouroboros and it symbolizes a circle of life. And it was a tattoo that my brother had on his left shoulder. So when he, and it was super important to him. So when he decided to start the winery, he decided to use that as his label, but it was already his tattoo. And, you know, now knowing where the story has gone, it's even, it's even more relevant because it's just about continuation and like kind of that not breaking of the cycle and with, the winery continuing, even though he's passed away, um, we feel like it's even more, it's like, what did he know, right? We always wonder sometimes if people know. And with his son, do you see him taking on like a really hands-on role with the winery in the direction that it's going in in the future as he grows into it? Obviously being so young, he's, you know, 24, he's a little, about the same age as us. He's got a long way to go, but is he really taking sort of a hands-on approach to it? Yeah, you know, he's never had any pressure. You know, I really decided to continue this for me more than anybody else. Um, but he, he knows he has the option. He did work harvest for us in 2018 after he graduated from college. And then last year he went with his girlfriend to France. She's from um, the south of France. And so they moved to Paris because she wanted to get her master's degree. 
he has taken it upon himself to work harvest the last two years. So last year he went and worked at Domaine de Champs, which is where my brother worked harvest for six years. So really cool experience. And right now he's actually in Alsace at Domaine Ostertag and working harvest there. And they make a lot of the Alsatian, they make Pinot Gris, Pinot Blanc, Riesling. And he picked in their biodynamic. So he picked that all on his own. Um, so he wants to do that every year that he's in Europe. We're not sure how long he's going to be there, but eventually he wants to come back and be part of production. Nice. Yeah, that's an incredible fair. experience. And yeah. I've heard it's beautiful. It's funny. Our winemaker was like, well, when do I get to go work harvest? <laughs> and I'm like, I told him, I was like, actually, I think you'd go to, you know, um, New Zealand or Australia. And he's like, no, I want to go to Alsace. And I'm like, okay, well, then next year you just <laughs> plan it ahead of time and make sure we all know and we can work around you not being there for two weeks if you've done a good job training your team but he's really eager to get over there. I'm sure that would be a huge experience for him that he really wants to do. Uh, so where can everyone find you guys online and on social media? So online it's brookswine.com um, and I mentioned we do have our shop page on there. We also have at the, in the footer, there's something called Brook Stories, which is a weekly email that I write that really just tells stories. It's not, you know, again, I'm so not the hard sell person. Um, social media, it is Brooks Winery, both on Twitter and Instagram, and it is Brooks Wines on Facebook. And we are never short of content. Um, we have more content than most people and have a hard time like keeping up with it and managing. So you're not going to see a lot of duplication across channels. We really try to use each channel for what its intended audiences um, and make sure that, that we get our stuff out there that way. So. Great. And we will put a link to all of your, your website and your social pages in the um, notes of the podcast as well. Great. Awesome. We had such a great time talking to you. Thank you for taking the time. Cheers. 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 Be sure to follow us on social at Uncorked Corner and on the blog at uncorkedcorner.com for a taste of more food and beverage content. And if you enjoyed the show, don't forget to leave a comment, subscribe, rate, and review on whatever podcast platform you prefer. Thanks for listening.